Hi, I'm Rowan from Vantage Admissions. In this video, we're going to work through an Oxford Physics interview question, which will culminate in a derivation of Snell's law. This hints at one of the deepest principles in modern physics, that almost all physical laws can be deduced from some sort of minimization problem. If you're interested in more interview questions or broader support with your interview preparation, do remember to subscribe and to visit our website. So we're given here a situation which is analogous to the passage of a ray of light. We're thinking about a lifeguard trying to run to, to save a flailing swimmer. So Alice the lifeguard spots Bob, a swimmer, who is struggling in the water. Now she can run on the sand with a speed V1 and she can swim in the water with a slower speed of V2. She wants to reach Bob as quickly as possible. He's obviously really in trouble in the water. So her priority is to get to him in the least amount of time possible. We need to find a constraint on the path. Note they're not asking us to find specifically what the path is, but to find a constraint on the path, which minimizes the time that she takes to reach him. And we want to reason how it relates to Snell's law. So in this question, we've been given a diagram with some annotated lengths and distances. It might be in a different posing of this question, which we do see reported quite a lot, actually, that you would need to take the initiative to draw the diagram yourself. Now, I'd strongly recommend that you pause the video here and have a good go at this question yourself before watching further. And assuming you've now unpaused or have decided to skip having a go yourself today, let's now solve the problem. So whenever we have an optimization problem, whenever we have to decide, you know, a constraint that's going to minimize or maximize something, the sort of zero thought of question that we have to ask ourselves is what is the degree of freedom what is the thing that can actually be done differently, that can actually be varied, that we want to somehow, you know, choose optimally? Clearly, when Alice is running, she's going to want to run in a straight line because she's traveling at a constant speed while she's running on the sand. And we know that the path will be shortest between two points if it's a straight line path. It would clearly introduce inefficiency for her to curve. Likewise, when she's swimming, she should go in a straight line. But the degree of freedom is where on the shoreline she chooses to aim at. It's not obvious that she wants to go in the straight line from her starting point to Bob because the speeds are different for each stage of the journey. So intuitively, she might, for example, like to bend her path a little bit so that she spends a larger portion of the journey on the sand when she's faster. So you'll see in the example drawn here, she actually bends her path down a bit, which kind of prioritizes the sand a bit. So given that the degree of freedom is the point on the shoreline that she actually makes the, the transition from sand to water on, we just need a single variable x, which we define here to measure how far down she's gone from the starting point by the time she actually reaches the shoreline and starts to swim. We've also annotated some extra lengths. The total horizontal distance that she has to travel on the sand, we call that a the total horizontal distance she has to travel in the water, we call that B, and the total, the total vertical difference that she has to travel to get to Bob, we call that L. Okay, so let's begin by trying to write down a function for the, the total travel time. So clearly, I'll call it T of X, because it's a function of X. Clearly, we can just add the total time she spends on the sand to the total time she spends in the water. It's a constant speed in each instance, so we can just use that time is distance divided by speed. So in terms of when she's on the sand, clearly by Pythagoras, this is a right angle triangle, obviously, the distance she has to travel is going to be square root x squared plus a squared. So the time she'll spend is that distance divided by the speed at which she's traveling. Similarly, when she swims, we have this right angle triangle. Now, this length here is obviously L minus X, just by comparing distances, because this is L, but we've already taken account of X from the earlier portion of the journey. So by Pythagoras, the distance now is going to be L minus X squared plus B squared. That's the distance divided by V2 to get the time. So... If I want to find when this is minimized, it makes sense that we might want to differentiate it to study turning points. Of course, 
just by looking at the equation, we're clearly not going to be able to actually solve for the turning point. It's going to be a very horrible equation, but we only need a constraint. We are going to need to think a little bit carefully to convince ourselves that the minimum time really does happen at a turning point or a stationary point, because we know that functions might not always be optimized, minimized, maximized at turning points. Sometimes it can be the end of the domain. So clearly we need that x is somewhere between zero and l. Any other x wouldn't make sense. There's no reason to go up, nor is there any reason to overshoot. Um, so in theory, it's possible that the end of the domain could do better than the turning point. We will need to address that to handle the question properly. But let's start at least by looking at the derivative, the first derivative. So we can use the chain rule. That is clearly going to differentiate to give x over root x squared plus a squared using the chain rule. So that's like a power of a half. So I bring down a multiple of a half and I reduce the power to minus a half, hence it's a division. But then I also pick up a 2x from the chain rule. So the 2 cancels the half and we're left with the x. So a nice easy derivative. And then the second term we can differentiate very similarly, except now we're going to get a minus sign from the chain rule because the derivative of l minus x squared is going to be minus 2l minus x by the chain rule on l minus x squared. Or if you like, you could expand the brackets. But either way, we're going to pick up a minus sign. So we're going to get l minus x over square root l minus x squared plus b squared. And they're still the one over v2. So the v's are constants. They don't participate in the derivative. So we would surely quite like to declare that dt by dx is zero at the minimum, right? That, that seems like an obvious thing to try and do. That would give me a constraint. These things look a bit like lengths over lengths. They might turn into signs, which should make us think Snell's law. So in general, this looks quite promising. But as I said, we don't know for sure that at the minimum, it really is going to be the case that we're at a turning point. The global minimum, the lowest value the function ever takes, sometimes might not be at a turning point. I mean, consider, for example, this function on a restricted domain. So you'll notice for this function on a restricted domain, the lowest value I ever take is actually not at the local minimum. It's at an end of the interval. This is an important principle that we need to deal with. So I suppose there's a few things that we could try to do. Uh, one nice thing might be to inspect the second derivative. So the second derivative should let us ascertain the nature of any stationary point. Maybe if we're really lucky, the second derivative will be always positive or always negative. That would be very nice because remember, we're not expecting to actually solve for the turning point. And it might just give us a little bit more of an intuition for the behavior of the function at t in general as x varies. So let's try and take the second derivative. It shouldn't be too bad. So we can use the quotient rule. Um, so on this term, I'm going to get low d high minus high d low over the square of what's below. And for this term, same principle. Low d high, derivative of that is minus one, minus high, and let me move this over a bit. So numerator is just our minus x. D low, remember, came with a minus. So minus minus makes plus L minus x over the rooty bit over the square of what's below. So squaring gets rid of the square root. So a little bit tedious, but this looks like it might be amenable to quite a bit of simplification. In particular, it's got these annoying nested fractions. Why don't we start by getting rid of those? So if in this fraction, I multiply through top and bottom by that, and in this fraction, I multiply through top and bottom by that, I'll get a power of three over two on the numerator, on the denominator rather, that's completely fine, and I won't have nested fractions anymore. So let's try doing that. So on the first term, when I multiply through by that, I lose the square root on that guy, and that one, well, that goes, so I just get a minus x squared. Now, this is a, a promising sign we're doing something sensible because now that numerator has simplified a tremendous amount. That's divided by now x squared plus a squared to the 3 over 2. And then for this term, we play the same game. 
So when I multiply through by that, this term, remember it already had a minus, is now minus L minus X squared minus B squared, because of that minus, and the fact that I lose the square root upon multiplying through by that. This term is just plus L minus X squared. And down there, that's now, I've got three over two of them because I've multiplied through by that square rooted and I did have one of them. Now again, a very promising sign we're on the right lines because now I've got an extremely simple expression, which is just V1 a squared over x squared plus a squared to the three over two minus minus makes plus b squared over v2 l minus x squared plus b squared to the three over two. And that is clearly always positive because everything in the expression is going to be positive. So this is really useful. We know that the second derivative, just by taking the initiative to do the algebra to plow through, is always positive. Now, what does that tell me? One thing that tells me is that any turning point is going to be a local minimum because that's the second order derivative condition for a minimum. But maybe now, because I have such a constraint on the second derivative, we can also think a little bit more about the graph of t in general to convince ourselves something about what's going to happen in terms of whether it's an end of an interval or a turning point that does best. So if I look at the first derivative, I can see very clearly, I mean, I'm just thinking, do I start with a positive gradient or a negative gradient? I know the gradient's always increasing because the second derivative is positive, but do I start negative or positive? Well, if I evaluate that at x equals zero, I get, well, that's just zero. And that there is going to be minus L over V2 over that stuff. That's clearly a negative number. So I know that I start wherever I am with a negative gradient and my gradient only ever increases. So it becomes less negative and then it becomes positive. So we can see we start with a negative gradient, which only increases. So just graphically reasoning, this is really just coming from the fact the second derivative is always positive we can see that there is clearly going to be a single turning point, which is the global minimum, the minimum value ever taken by the function. So we're being very careful here. If this is a problem you've seen before, you might see in some places they don't worry about second derivatives. They just impose that the first derivative vanishes. It is best to be careful. And that is more likely what the interviewer would be nudging you towards. So now I can impose that this is zero. And we've already noted that imposing that this is zero as our constraint is going to very quickly start to look a bit like Snell's law. So I know that that's meant to be zero. So I get, because I know I'm, I'm looking for the minimum, right? I'm looking for the turning point. So I've got one over V1, X over square root X squared plus A squared equals for that to vanish, one over V2, L minus X over square root L minus X squared plus B squared. Now, these look like they should be expressible in terms of signs by considering our right angled triangles earlier. And indeed, that's clearly the case. So I've written theta one here. This is analogous to the angle of incidence. Remember that we knew from the start we were thinking about Snell's law. So opposite over hypotenuse is sine theta one. Well, x over root x squared plus a squared is exactly what we've got. So sine theta one over v one. And then similarly over here, if you think about the other right angled triangle, I've marked on theta two analogous to the angle of refraction. And we can see opposite hypotenuse L minus x over that square rooty business. So that is nothing other than sine theta two. Sine theta two over v2. Now this looks a lot like Snell's law. Let's try to finish the Snell's law analogy by rewriting the velocities in terms of refractive indices. So remember that the refractive index in a medium is given by the speed of light in a vacuum over the speed of light in the medium. So that means that the speed of light in a medium that's like my V1, V2, because the sand and the water are like media. 
is going to be the speed of light in a vacuum. Now, I know Alice is not a ray of light. She doesn't have a speed of light in a vacuum, but we'll see You know, when we make the analogy, it doesn't really matter. The speed of light in a vacuum divided by the refractive index. So we're trying to identify the refractive index of sand, the refractive index of water, even though we don't really have an intuition for what C speed of light means in this analogy, it doesn't matter because it's clearly just going to cancel on both sides of the equation anyway. So we can write the equation as sine theta 1 divided by, so V1 is now going to be C over N1, just by using this relation, trying to pose it in the language of refractive indices, and sine theta 2 divided by C over N2 is going to be what we get on the right-hand side. So I can write that as n1 sine theta 1 over c equals n2 sine theta 2 over c. The c's that we don't really know how to interpret cancel, and we are left with Snell's law. So this is a beautiful proof. It hints at some work that was actually originally done by Fermat, showing that Snell's law can be derived purely by the constraint that the light will take the path that minimizes the transit time. And this hints at a uh, you know, much more modern idea in physics that optimization principles using things called Lagrangians are generally the best way to formulate physics problems. And that's something that you'll explore in much more detail at university. I hope you found this question interesting. Do let us know in the comments what you'd like to see next. Thanks very much for watching and please remember to like and subscribe.